Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Daniel Oppenheimer. I'm the land program manager at the Hill Country Alliance. Happy to welcome you here to the YMCA's Roberts Ranch. We're down near Comfort, Texas on a tributary of the Guadalupe River. And today we're here to talk to you about riparian areas. What are they? Why do they matter? And how can we be good stewards to riparian areas in our hill country creeks and rivers? So again, we're happy to have you out here and uh, hope you learn a thing or two. Thanks. Hello, my name is Steve Nelly, and we're here at the Roberts Ranch to uh, discuss riparian areas and why they're important. So by way of review, a riparian area is simply that narrow strip of land that lies adjacent to and parallel creeks and rivers. This little strip of land may only make up 1% of the landscape, but it's far more important ecologically and has some functions that are really important that landowners understand. So a, a properly functioning riparian area would be one that is very thickly vegetated with native plants, a diversity of native plants. And the reason we need that kind of uh, plant density and plant amount is to think about when these creeks get on a rise and the water fills the channel and there's a lot of energy coming down these creeks that th the vegetation actually dissipates the energy of the running water. It slows the water down. It's not as erosive. And in fact, the vegetation along a riparian area slows the water down enough that it traps sediment and it begins to build up soil in the adjacent areas. So what that does over time is when you slow down the floodwaters with vegetation, it gives more time for those waters to sink back into the valley, back into the floodplain. So a landowner can actually make his creek wetter by proper management of the riparian area. This riparian area is in the process of healing up. It had been uh, severely grazed previously. The cattle have been removed, which was the most important thing that can be done, removed temporarily. And what we're going to show today is two methods of restoration. One would be more passive restoration and one is more active. So on this particular location, you're gonna see that the creek channel is dry. It's a seasonal creek. There's still a water table underneath our feet that's sustaining all of this vegetation. But as time goes on, this vegetation is gonna get thicker and thicker and taller and taller and it's happening, it's happening naturally, but we can also uh, accelerate that restoration and that recovery by planting appropriate native species. And so we have planted six or eight uh, different species here in an effort simply to jumpstart and try to um, accelerate this natural healing process. These riparian areas, they're resilient and they can heal themselves on their own, but there might be certain occasions where we want to help jumpstart their recovery. So one of the methods we can use uh, is called cuttings. There are certain tree species like sycamore and black willow and box elder where you can take a cutting. Now this is a method we do not right now in the heat of August, but during the dormant season. Once all these trees have lost their leaves, you come out again for certain species like a box elder, a black willow, or a sycamore and you want to find a nice young branch about the, this size, several feet in length, about the thickness of your thumb, smooth bark, you don't want a big branch with a lot of rough bark and you just take a little cutting um, and then you need to find a spot near the water, these species like to be near water and um, you might need a rock bar and you want to get these in the ground about one and a half to two feet so that they're really well into the soil. When they start growing roots, they're finding that groundwater. And then when you have a flood, they're in the ground deep enough to where they're not just gonna get knocked back out. So again, we use three different tree and shrub species for cuttings. With these species, they're very desirable. 
uh, deer love to browse on them, livestock love to browse on them. So you plant them in a pretty heavy density knowing you're gonna have some uh, impact from those uh, browsers. And so here's uh, the black willow. You can see it, it struggled a little bit with the heat, but it's still got some good green growth on it. We planted around 100 of these. Here's a live one that's hanging in there doing pretty darn well. If you look up, this is just a little higher up on the terrace. This is one that uh, did not make it through the growing season. And so again, we planted about a hundred of these black willow and these are smaller than we would typically plant usually you'd like one that's again about the thickness of your thumb a few feet high that can hopefully get above the browse height faster and um, of the hundred or so black willows that we planted we had about a 50 percent survival um, which between the drought and browsers we're pretty darn happy with here's another example of one of those uh little black willow cuttings that we planted that's hanging on doing pretty happy maybe a little dry um, this is the second species of cuttings that we planted this is a sycamore tree and we had uh, about 70 percent survival of sycamore cuttings uh, that made it through the the dry season we had a couple of hot dry summer months not a drought but still noticeably hot and dry uh, we had some browse on some of the cuttings up above, but again, 70% survival, we're pretty darn happy with. So again, we talked about the black willow, had about 50% survival. The sycamore, about 70% survival. The third species of cuttings that we used was the box elder tree. Um, and just as with the sycamores, we had about 70% survival. So you can see, here's a few happy ones that are doing just fine in the riparian area. Here's an example of one that looks like it never quite um, got going. Um, again, a couple of hot, dry months, uh, some browse from, uh, from native deer, exotic species, uh, probably impacted some of these cuttings. But overall, this method, um, it's very simple. If you have some of these species on your property, all you need to do is flag them during the growing season when they've got their leaves and you can easily identify them go back out in the winter time once they're dormant they're less stressed out um, and you find those trees that you flag they again cut off some cuttings about the thickness of your thumb get them in the ground give them a little water and um, you should be good to go hi there i'm ryan mcgillicuddy i'm a conservation biologist with the texas parks and wildlife department and uh, today i'm going to talk to you a little bit about reseeding which is another method that we can use to jump start the restoration process um, before we uh, show you some of our results, we'll talk a little bit about some of the methods that we used at this particular location. Uh, really the first thing that you're going to want to think of when uh, reseeding is your location. So are we on bare ground? Are we close to the creek? Are we a little bit higher up on the bank? And that's going to help you determine what seed mix you choose. If you're somewhere like on this uh, gravel bar that doesn't have much nutrient matter, it's a little bit more nutrient deprived, it might get a little bit more full sun, you're going to want to choose uh, a grass uh, that doesn't mind that environment, something like a switchgrass or a bushy blue stem or an eastern gamma. If you're in the shade a little bit higher up, things that might like to be there are things like southwestern bristlegrass or um, switchgrass will do okay in there, but things like inland sea oats and uh, wild rye will do better in that environment. So once you've selected your seed mix, the next thing people most often worry about is timing. Uh, things like wildflowers, uh, forbs, tend to want to be seeded and germinate in the fall, uh, where they'll germinate the, the following spring. Uh, but planted in the fall, uh, our grasses, most often uh, we're want, gonna wanna do the, uh, the seeding in the late winter, early spring. Now we used a mix here of 36 different uh, species um, that uh, include wildflowers and grasses. So a mix like this can really be planted any time in that cool season between about October and February or early March. Now the seeding method is pretty easy. You can do it a couple different ways. You can simply broadcast by hand like you're feeding chickens and just tossing it on the ground. Uh, or if you want to be a little bit more methodical and have more even distribution, you can use a seed spreader like this, which just broadcasts it evenly across the area. Now, following the seeding, you're going to want to make sure that you work the seed into the soil a little bit. Now you don't want to bury it too much because a seed really can't germinate if it's buried more than about twice uh, the depth as the seed is wide. And if you notice, some of our native seed is very, very small. So you're going to want to just gently rake it in with the back of a rake after you've uh, 
um, uh, uh, spread it on the ground. So just gently moving over it to just add a little bit of a, uh, 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 a soil layer over it. You can do that with the back of a, a cedar bough, something like that, or you can simply even just walk over the area and step it in. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the methods for seeding. Um, now let's go look at some of the results. So at Roberts Ranch, uh, we have had a what we call a deferment. So cattle have been pulled off uh, for about a year to give uh, the, the grasses, the vegetation, the opportunity to get jump started again uh, so we can increase uh, diversity and vigor of the vegetation. So we mentioned that we've done some seeding, but there is an active seed bank here as well. You can see mature grasses like this Lindheimer muley, uh, like these Indian grasses here that were already in place that are going to contribute to the seed bank uh, now that we have uh, time for uh, the area to rest out of grazing. So cattle will come back about a year from now, uh, and perhaps longer, and we will have increased the, the forage, the palatability for those animals. Um, so that's part of the goal of what we've done here. Um, but what happens is we've added some seed to these bare areas uh, to just increase that diversity, uh, increase the plant matter. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna start trapping sediment, starting to colonize and build this floodplain like Steve mentioned earlier, that allows water to infiltrate and it stores water like a sponge, holding on to water longer throughout the year. So we've got increased forage, we've got increased water storage, and we've got increased um, stability of our stream banks. So those are our values. Um, now, if we talk for a moment about hindrances, uh, those would be things like overgrazing, uh, things like exotic uh, species like axis deer or an overabundance of white-tailed deer that might come in and prohibit some of these plants from really growing up to their true potential, to their vigor. Uh, so we want to make sure that things like that are well managed, uh, you know, managed thoughtfully. Um, so if we look at the results of what our seeding is to fill in some of the gaps, you can see that all over this bare gravel bank, uh, this gravel bar, we see a bunch of different plants that are about three inches high. We seeded this whole area and you can see that we're starting to get a pretty good start uh, on all these plants. Now we did have a very dry uh, summer that inhibited the growth uh, a little bit, but we got a little bit of rain um, just last week that's, uh, that, that's helped this stuff green up a little bit. So overall, we are very pleased with the results of our uh, seeding efforts combined with the transplants and the stakes. I think we're off to a very good start. We're going to now look at the third method of, of our recovery restoration that we attempted here. We planted from potted, potted material that had been grown by a grower, uh, five different riparian species. We planted emery sedge, spike rush, scouring rush, switchgrass, and eastern gamma grass. And we had anywhere from uh, around 20 to 25 of those. And we had this group of volunteers, totally unskilled labor. All you need is a shovel and a willingness to work. So we took these one gallon potted materials. In many cases, we would take a hatchet and we may split up a one gallon pot into three separate plants. And they just took their shovels, but there's places all along here that uh, were suitable for planting of riparian species. Three of the species we planted right along the water line. And mind you that there was running water in this creek at the time we planted even though it's dried up now. So three of the species we planted right down here where we know it was wet. Two of the species we planted up on this higher bench, which is approximately two to three feet higher. Uh, all in all, we were pleased with the success. We had 50% uh, survival on emery sedge. I'll show you in a minute. We had about 60% survival on spike rush we had an 85% survival on scouring rush, and then we believe that about a 50% survival on both the switchgrass and the eastern gamma grass. So all in all, we're pleased. We were fortunate that we had some favorable rains this spring, and that's always gonna be a large factor in success is what kinds of rains you get. You don't want too much, you don't want too little. So we consider this a pretty successful project. We want to look at some of the species that we planted and the success we had. So this first example, just to give you an idea of what scouring rush looks like, it's actually a type of fern 
that it grows naturally along many riparian areas. It's got good strong roots. It's rated as a seven on a scale of one to 10 on root strength. And this one plant is going to expand in diameter as the time goes on. So this is scouring rush. And then right next to it, this entire clump here where my stick is, is at is called spike rush. It's a type of sedge and you can see that there's probably a, at least a couple of plantings here that did very well. It's starting to spread. It weeps over into the channel. And what's interesting about this particular species of spike rush is that where the leaf tips arch over and if they touch wet ground, they begin to take root. So we can almost expect exponential increase from spike rush. There's several plants that here. One, two, three. The, the grass that's back behind this scouring rush, kind of a bluish gray color, is some of the uh, switchgrass that we planted. There's also some natural switchgrass in here, so it's impossible to say which ones of these we planted and which came up naturally. The next plant we want to feature is this one right here at the tip of my stick. This is emery sedge, and this is one of the most strong-rooted, valuable riparian plants that we have in the whole hill country. It's a sedge that produces extremely strong roots. It's rated a nine on a scale of one to 10. And here it, here it is again, next to a switchgrass. This plant is going to spread by rhizome. So even though it's just one isolated clump right now, we expect it to expand both directions along the water lines. Thanks again for joining us down at uh, YMCA's Roberts Ranch. Again, we're here today to talk about riparian areas, what they are, why they matter, when they function properly, all the tremendous values that they can provide to us, to livestock, to fish, and to wildlife. Again, these are resilient systems. They can heal up on their own, but to do that, we have to manage the stressor. And you're gonna to need to go out to your own property, think about what those stressors might be. Perhaps it's excessive mowing, perhaps it's excessive grazing, Perhaps it's the high number of native whitetail or exotic deer species like axis deer. Understanding your riparian system and how to manage those stressors is critical to success. And then once you have that understanding, you can help jumpstart the system by using some of the planting methods that we've discussed today. One thing we didn't mention is with some of these plantings, one thing you can do to protect them from grazers, from browsers, is to use uh, either caging material, or you can just take some cedar slash. You can form a donut around your plantings, and that's gonna deter certain herbivores for wanting to get their mouth in there to start nibbling on your plantings. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I wanna thank some of our partners who made this whole process uh, possible. I wanna thank the YMCA Roberts Ranch, the Upper Guadalupe River Authority. If you're a landowner in Kerr County and have questions about taking care of the river, or taking care of the natural resources, make sure you get in touch with them. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Plateau Land and Wildlife Management, and all the great volunteers at Texas Master Naturalists. If you'd like to learn more, um, there's a lot of resources, the partners I just mentioned. Uh, if you email me at daniel at hillcountryalliance.org, again, daniel at hillcountryalliance.org, uh, we can send you uh, the packet, which gives a nice distillation of these planting methods we've discussed today. With that, again, we appreciate your time and all your stewardship. Thanks.